without reading your books. Okay, tell me what is what is the main subject of this of this scripture? What's the subject of the scripture? Keep looking up. Don't look down. If you look down, you're going to be in trouble. Yes. Return of Jesus? No. Nope. But I want the subject of this. The subject matter of this. Bobby? Exactly. That's exactly what it is. As it was in the days of Noah. So the subject of it is what was happening during the days of Noah. Okay. And that's one of the ways of interpret. that is the way of interpreting the scripture. Because you want to find out what the subject matter is first. Now, is it important that it will also be in the days of the Son of Man? Yes. But the subject of it is as it was in the days of Noah. So you have to go back to the principle of first mention of where that is in the Bible, and you have to read that, and it's in Genesis, right? We know that, we understand that's in Genesis uh, chapters 6 through 8. If you want to know what it was like during the time of uh, Noah, you have to go back and read about it. And always remember, Scripture interprets Scripture. We've taught that so, so often. But my question was, what was one of the major uh, aspects of that time? What was one of the major things that was happening of why God destroyed the earth? Yes, Nelson's got it. Violence. Violence. It, it was, violence was at an uproar. Okay? And that's exactly one of the signs that you and I can judge by. What were some of the other signs? What were some of the other signs that were happening during the times of Noah? See, we read these scriptures, but you need to go back and read these other scriptures in Genesis, and that's why I don't believe in new, just a New Testament church where they have just a New Testament. Because you need the Old Testament, because the Old Testament will be also giving you light to the New Testament. Okay? So what were some of the other things that were going on that could kind of give you a clue of how close we really are to the coming of the Son of Man? That was in the days of Lot, yeah. That, that was homosexuality would be on the rise, but what else? Party? <laughs> oh, the drinking, the partying and stuff. Yeah, okay, yeah. But what else? Lawlessness, yeah. What else? People turning their back on God, very good. What else? Hmm. Yeah, that was probably there, but that's... I'm talking about in the account of Genesis with, with what we have revealed in Scripture as far as the days of Noah. What else was going on? Huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Annie. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's great. What I was trying to narrow down and pinpoint was, who is Noah? He was a man of God. What does the Bible call him? He was a man of righteousness. He was a man of righteousness and he was preaching, right? How many people listened? Seven, okay. But as he was preaching year after year while that ship was being built, he was sounding the alarm, he was preaching righteousness. The people would not listen. Don't we see that today? You tell them about God, oh, don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear about Jesus. I don't want to hear about that. They're stopping up their ears. I don't want to hear about it. 
I want to hear about being saved. I, I'm okay. I'm all right. When I get judged, I'm going to judge by the good and the bad I've done. And you know, you heard the whole story of what people go through. But the thing about it is, is that if you look at that time where there was, pre there was righteousness being preached, but it was being uh, on a larger scale rejected, isn't that what's happening today? So as you begin to see this, see the whole thing isn't so much of us looking back at Noah's day and just to look back as for information, but it was to look back to see what would the climate be just before the days of the Son of Man being revealed. Now, if I told you that at noontime tomorrow, Jesus Christ was coming back, what would you do? Hmm? Make sure you're ready. <laughs> Vicky says I'd be at work. She'd be at work. Why would she be at work? So in other words, what Vicky is saying is I'm ready. That's right, you would continue doing what you're doing, but you'd be ready. ready. You don't have to stop and make sure you're not, you know, because if you have to stop and see if you're ready, that means something may be not quite right in your life. Right? So you should be ready. There should be no reason, rhyme of why you shouldn't be ready. So when you interpret Scripture like that, doesn't it bring a fuller meaning to you? Don't you get even more excited to know that we're in the last days? And doesn't that incite you to live more godly and, and more righteously and to follow the word and follow Jesus and get closer to him and, and not worry about the world and what they're doing and just continue doing what you're doing and sharing the gospel with the unsaved and, you know, to your testimony and, and giving them out tracts to people and give, letting them know about Jesus? That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what the church is supposed to be doing. So again... Because of that, do I have water? I do. I don't know if this was up here. So when you interpret the scripture with other scriptures, it enhances the meaning. Okay. Uh, verse 27 says what? They did eat. They drank. They married wives. Notice that. They married wives, right? And they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. They, were, they kept on doing exactly what they were doing right to the end of when Noah entered the ark. What happened when, when he started entering into the ark? Now, you have to, you have to picture this in your mind. Here's a man, right? God tells him, I want you to build a ship. Okay. I forget how many feet long, 150 feet long or something like that? 45 feet wide, I think 80 feet high. I forgot the dimensions of it, but it's in the Bible, but I just forgot what they were. It's like a cruise ship out of gopher wood and pitch, and he's, he's going to build this thing. No one has ever built a ship like this ever in history. So here, and, and you've got to understand this, okay? The reason that God asked Noah to build this ship, there was no water around. There was no ocean nearby. And if there was, how's he going to get the ship there? They didn't have trailers in the Ford F-150s. Okay, so how were they going to, how was, how, how was, so people were coming up and seeing him, Hey, Noah, you know, what are you doing? I'm building a ship. What's, what's it for? Well, God spoke and said that he's going to bring his wrath upon the earth, and he's going to bring rain, and it's going to flood the earth. 
Are you serious? Noah, I think, you're, I think you've lost a, a few steps, you know. I, I, think, I think you need to go see a psychiatrist. I think... Well, you're saying a voice told you that? I, maybe you're hearing things. Maybe you're, you're schizo. Maybe something's wrong with you. So think about this. Yet he was still a preacher, and he would preach righteous. And every single day he'd build a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And I'm sure that there were people that ridiculed him and laughed at him and went by and goes, look at him, he's building a ship because it's going to rain. It hasn't rained in a... And they laughed at him, mocked him, until the day he entered the ship. Look at that. Look at him. Look at the fool going in there. What are you going to do in there? You're going to die of, of heat because of the heat out here. And then God closed the door, and it started to rain. Can you imagine those people, what they thought when it began to rain? How they said, oh, it's just a rainstorm, you know, it's, it's going to pass. You know, the weather, I was watching weather on cable, you know. They said it's going to pass. It's just a, a fleeting storm. Then it was up to their ankles. Now they're running toward the ark and they're banging on the door. Think about that. Children like Vicky's got in her lap. Mothers banging on the door. I'm sorry, I repent. Let me in, let me in, let me in, let me in. Isn't that kind of what it's going to be like? We are living in that last day. So that's one of the ways you interpret the scriptures is by going back to the first principle of mention, where it's mentioned in scripture, and read it. Do you know so many people don't read all the way through things? I'll give you an example. This is a good, a good example of how to take something out of context because it just happened recently. Someone approached me and, and said, um, hey, you know that Leisha's sister Gordon is, is moving to California? Huh? Brother, what did I say? I, I said sister? Oh, I, said, I thought I said sister's brother. No? Okay. All right. You got it? Okay. I'm trying to get this, you know, in my head here. I wasn't planning on this, so when I say things, sometimes I... Okay. But anyway, um, my sister's brother, Gordon. You're my sister, right? I can say that? Okay. So I said, no. And they said, yeah, it's in Facebook. Look, I mean, it's, it's, he wrote it right here. I, and I looked for it, and I couldn't find it. And so I, I said, let me see it. So I, I started reading it. Yep, going to, going to move to California. He's got a house available to him. He's going to have a new salary. and everything. He's going to have a new start and all this stuff. And, just want to thank everybody and all this stuff. And then I rolled it up a little bit and I started reading it. It says, if you read this, this is a joke, you know, blah, 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 to, to see how many people would read it to the end. So I asked the person, I said, did you read it to the end? They said, yes. I said, no, you didn't. I said, look it, read this part. But I, 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 and I just use that as an example because I want you to understand that you can spread a rumor and a lie by reading something out of context and, and, and tell people, oh, God is moving to California. But if you read it all the way through, you find out it was a joke and he's not moving to California. That's how it is when you take things out of context in Scripture. Yeah, really, a lot of people, and, and you know, the person that showed me that, they, they weren't the only one. There was people that were saying, bon voyage, you know, have a great time, you know, pray, you know. Well, we'll be praying for you. But, I, uh, but again, I don't, only, I, don't only blame the per, you know, I don't only blame the person that didn't read it all the way through, but I, I blame, okay, I blame them for not knowing to read it all. And please, if you ever see anything on, on Facebook, Pastor Bob is dying, please read it all because it might be for ice cream. Okay, don't go around spreading lies saying, Pastor Bob is dying. That's it. He's dying. You didn't read it all. He's dying for ice cream. Okay. And, and I use that as an example because I want to show you how important it is to take 
things in context. Last week's lesson was a good, valuable lesson for you. I hope that you, uh, if you want the, if you want the uh, slide that I had about showing a commentary and what it was said, and it, you may even have it, but if you look at it, how ridiculous it is when a person puts the meaning into the scripture and it has no bearance of any kind of context or any kind of exegetical uh, validity. It's, it's, it's crazy. And yet people, how many times, how many people just passed right over that? Just passed right over that. So it's very important. So let's look at the symbols. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 41 and 42. First Corinthians 15. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. One star differs from another star in glory. Verse 42. So also, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. So when you look at this, you see that the, the sun in this passage is referring to the great, greater light ruling the day, the moon is lesser light ruling the night, and the stars are referred to as having a part in the night. They were given to divide the light from the darkness, to give light upon the earth, and for signs and seasons, days and years. The heavenly bodies are characterized by rulership and varying glories and light bearing, which aids us in understanding the significance of the statements in 1 Corinthians 15, 41 and 42. So you see the difference. Okay? A lot of people would take this and say, oh, let's worship the sun, let's worship the moon, let's worship the stars. And they do that. Okay? And no, it's not talking about it. It's just talking about the glory of one and the glory of another one. And so also is it of the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Um, when you read about the, the sun and the moon and the stars, and you read about the different planets and everything, how many know that God, God knew way before, uh, who was it that discovered the world wasn't, wasn't flat? It was Christopher Columbus, wasn't it? No, who was it? Was it, was it him? Okay. Well, you know, and, and you had all, all these people saying that the world was flat. And you know, today, even sometimes today, the scientists, some, some people are saying the world's flat. Okay. All they had to do was read the Psalms. He sits above the circle of the earth. Okay? So God knows what's going on. He knows how to create everything. So when you look at the sun, the moon, and the stars, and, and they say everything is in, in space is, is, is dying. It's slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. But God never created it to be that way. That's what the fall did. Okay? But you're going to see a whole different new, he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. There'll be no more need for the sun, for the glory of the Lord will shine upon it. That's going to be a glorious time, isn't it? Praise God. Okay, let's look at the persons. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 2. Revelation 20, verse 2. Some people would read this and say, see, there were dragons back then. Okay. Okay. Are you having fun? Does that taste good? You like that? I'm glad. Good. Keep eating it. <laughs> okay. Revelation 20, verse 2 says, And he laid hold on the dragon. Huh? 
I, that's a little dragon. That's a dragonette. <laughs> okay. When you first read that, you say, and he laid hold on a dragon. What comes to your mind? A fire-breathing dragon, you know. Remember all the Chinese, uh, Japanese movies, you know, with Godzilla and all that stuff, when their mouths wouldn't match up to the words? They'd be like, how <laughs> Okay, and you see the dragons come out, you know, all the dragons and stuff like that. Uh, you see all the, the, these cartoons of dragons. That's not what he's talking about. Okay, it's a symbolic word, but it's really, in, in, it's really talking about Satan or the devil. The devil is not, not a snake. So some people are deathly afraid of snakes. They, they equate snakes with Satan. Okay, no. Okay, Satan is a fallen angel. Okay, you, you go back and, and you read it and you study it in the scriptures, you see that he's an angel. He's not a serpent. It's used as a serpent. Why? Because a serpent is slivery, you know, kind of sneaks up on his prey, and then strikes. Huh? Right, he used that as an instrument, okay, to speak through, okay, and, uh, but he, he's not the serpent, okay, he used the serpent, but he's not the serpent, it's symbolic, the devil is an is a angel, he has wings, I think if he was one of the highest angels in heaven, in charge of music. Did you know that? That Satan was in charge of all the music of heaven that would be bring worship. In fact, his whole being, when he breathed, was like an instrument, and it breathed out worship and praise to God. That was his, that was his ministry in heaven. Till, he, till pride was found in him and he fell. Because he, he said in his heart that he wanted to be like God and he wanted to receive worship. And you look at the music industry today. Read the words. Read the lyrics of some of these songs. There were, Satan, it's, all, it's, it's incredible. See, music was invented. Our music was, was discovered to worship God. That was the, from the very beginning in heaven. Music was to worship God. It was to bring glory to God. Then when man fell... Man started to worship God. Remember Miriam sang and danced? You know, I will sing unto the Lord, for he is triumphant gloriously. The host of the right is going to the sea. Okay? That was all in worship. That dance that the, the Hebrews did was a Hebrew dance. It, was, it wasn't so much learned choreographically. It was led spirit, spiritually as the spirit led them. Okay? But what do you got today? Choreographed dancing. Trying to, trying to do in the flesh what only can be accomplished in the spirit. We see that a lot of that happening in churches today. You know, and they're waving flags and all that stuff. And that's, you know, you want to wave a flag, but, it, you know, what is it? Is it really bringing attention to you or to the Lord? You know, so anyway, so we, we got all of these things going on. And, um, but the devil is, is, is an angel. He's a fallen angel. He was charged of music. And that's why, to me, to me, this is me. I'm not saying this has to be you. But to me, I don't listen to secular music. Unless you're forced to, like you're at work and they're playing music and you can't get out of that. Okay. But I don't listen, to, I don't make it a, a point to listen to secular music. I mean, you know, Wind Beneath My Wings, eh. something like that. But I mean, this, I'm talking about the real bad stuff. Don't listen to it. Don't put it in my mind, don't put it in my spirit. So when you read this about Satan, the devil, and, and you, you read about the characteristics. Look at the characteristics of a snake and a dragon. And that's the characteristic of the devil. And it says, and they bound him a thousand years. When is that? Now, I taught this years ago. Maybe I need to do a refresher course.
When is the th what is the thousand years? When, when is he going to be bound? After Jesus returns. Why after Jesus returns? Well, the tribulation is before Jesus returns. Not the rapture. The rapture happens before, but the second coming of Jesus is after the tribulation period of seven years. He's going to come back. But why? What, what, when, is, when is he going to be bound for a thousand years? He'll govern the earth. What's that called, that time period? The millennial reign of Christ, the millennial kingdom, right? The thousand year millennial reign. Okay, and what's happening? Uh, what's happening after that? But I thought he was bound for a thousand years. It'll be loose for a short time. Now, where did you get that from? <laughs> it's all up in here. Well, it better be in here. <laughs> There's a lot of things up here that don't belong because they're not in here. <laughs> so you've got to find out, is it in here? Yes, it is. Yeah, that scripture is in here. He'll be, he'll be, he'll be let loose for a short period. It's in, it's in Revelation. Well, remember, we all got certificates in Revelation, so we all should know that. Hopefully. Okay. Let's go on to... Um, well, let me, let me ask first stop and ask, are there any questions about interpreting the Scriptures? How many, how many did get the um, Vines Dictionary? Who has Vines Dictionary? Okay, well, yeah, Linda, you would have it. Do you, you have it? Have it? No, no, Vines, Vines Dictionary is a smaller one. Okay. Um, you all have Strong's Concordance, right? Okay, most of you, a lot of you have that. Okay. Now, that's something you can develop a little library with. We talked about that. Um, but you have to pay for those books. I'm not buying them for you. I've bought so many of those books already, and, and it's, 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 you know, and they're 10 bucks, 15 bucks, whatever they are. Um, what can I say? Go without a latte for a week or whatever. You know, uh, no donuts or something. Oh, donuts? You like donuts? Okay, good. Um, any questions so far? This is a unique class. There's, everybody knows everything. There's no questions. Have you ever interpreted a scripture wrong? Okay, so, all right, let, let's talk about that for a minute because that's important. Do you remember the scripture, what, what it was? What was it? Okay, where two or three are gathered. Okay, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. <laughs> well, well, if you're not using it correctly, no, no, the one she's talking about is, is um, where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst as using it as a proof text for God's presence, for Jesus' presence. Okay, so in other words, hey, we're going to have a Bible study at my house tonight. You know, the Bible says, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I'll be in the midst. That's a misappropriation of the scripture, because that's not what it means. If you read the context there, it was about judgment, about bringing judgment. Wherever two or three are gathered together in his name to bring the, bring the person to a place of accountability, he would be there, his authority would be there. That's what that scripture means. 
It doesn't mean his presence because he's omnipresent. He's everywhere present all the time. And besides, Jesus is not here on earth. He's not coming back on earth. He's in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. We all know that. Even Catholics know that. Right? The only time you're going to see Jesus when he comes back again in the rapture or the second coming. When he came back to talk to Paul, did he come? Did he sit in Paul's bed and put his arm around him and tell him all the things he wanted to tell him? No. He met him on a Damascus road. A light from heaven shone down. He was there, and he shone down, and he said, Lord, so I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Now, I'm not trying to tell Jesus how to run his business. Okay? But you hear people all the time say, oh, I saw Jesus. You know, he came into my room, he sat on my bed, and he put his arm around me, told me that he loved me, and I felt this warmth come over me. And I, my first question to them is, tell me, what did he look like? Well, you know, like the picture. He had long hair, and he was white, and he had blue eyes. I said, that was a demon. And it kind of shocks them. And you're looking like me, at me like you're shocked. Well, that's not Jesus. He's not white. As soon as you hear these clues, he's white. No, he's not. He's Hebrew. He's a Jew. And I'm not making fun, but he's probably a little short guy with a big nose. We make this picture of Jesus like he's some handsome guy, you know, like Fabio, you know. Long hair, which I don't have. In the pictures, you know. And we see him in the movies, you know. No, the Bible says, if you were to look upon him, and you, you would not desire him. Isaiah says that. If you were to look upon him, you wouldn't desire him. So what does that tell you? He may be ugly. He may not be attractive. But we've made him out to be like this Hollywood star. That's not him. So when people come and say, he looks like the picture, you can, you can bet, put your money in the bank right there. That's not Jesus. My Bible tells me that he dwelleth in unapproachable light. You cannot approach that. Paul could not approach that. He lost his eyesight for three days at the revelation of who Jesus is now. Because he's not in his natural body. He's in his glorified body. Look at Revelation. How, how many want to see a picture of Jesus? You want to see a picture of Jesus? Want to see what he looks like now? Read Revelation. When John was taken up to heaven, and he, he had this revelation, and the angel took him there. And he, says, and I, I, he says, I heard a voice like the sound of many waters. He says, and I turned to see the voice, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He had hair as white as wool. His eyes were like a flame of fire. <laughs> He's describing Jesus. He's not like that picture. That's not him. That's just some religious, traditional thing that we put there, and we put the name Jesus on it, but that's idolatry. The Bible says, it says, in, I think it's in Corinthians, he says, for we know Christ after the flesh no longer. We don't know him after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And people think, just like Noah, he's crazy. He's crazy. I told you one time, I think I testified this, a sister had a picture of Jesus sitting on her, on her uh, table, end table, and I went to visit with her, and, and uh, you know me, I'm a smart aleck sometimes, you know, I do kind of strange, funny things. So I said to her, hey, can I see that picture of Jesus? She said, yeah. She says, what do you want it for? I said, I want to punch it in the face. And she went, you're going to punch Jesus in the face? And I said, see? I said, that's the problem. This is why God had me do that because you're attached to that picture and you, you think that's Jesus. You probably even kneel down to it and kiss it. That's not Jesus. That's not him. 
Oh, come on. Why do we think he's a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant? That's not him. Stop calling him Jesus. That's not him. It's some white guy that posed in a picture. For all we know, he could be a heathen. But it's the truth. And people go out and they'll spend like two, three hundred dollars on a picture. Look, oh, look, I got this picture. Look, look, look at the frame. It's all gold. Look, and look at Jesus is there with the sheep on his shoulder. See? And then I bust their bubble. And I tell them that's not Jesus. You might even hear some. Of, you might even see some of my posts on Facebook when people say, uh, "If you love Jesus, pass this on." You know what I write? First of all, that's not Jesus. That's a white man posing. He's an imposter. That's not Jesus. So don't try to intimidate me and be religious in tradition and I'm going to pass on a picture of Jesus. When that ain't Jesus, that's idolatry. I'm not doing it. Some people get upset with me. But I don't care. I'm going to speak the truth. That ain't Jesus. That's not good English, but you know. That ain't Jesus. Because the Bible says there's another Jesus. Paul says, if any man come preaching another Jesus, or do you receive another spirit, let him be anathema, let him be accursed. Because that's not the same Jesus. My Jesus is a Hebrew Jew, and I'm proud of it. I'm not one of those replacement theologists that say that the church has replaced Israel. That's a lie from the pit of hell. I believe that God... God's people and God's, uh, the Israelites are still God's chosen people. Yeah, rejoice, hallelujah. Even the children will cry out. Smurf. I'm going to have to pray for you, Violanta. Smurf. You see the important. So we were talking about scriptures that we've misinterpreted. Who, who has interpreted another mis, misinterpreted scripture? Who? Some, I saw some hands go, some heads going. Yeah, I done that. Who? Who else? You, all right, that, that's good. Well, praise God. You know, that's you have you, you're pretty good at it, huh? Oh, you're talking about the nut there? I was just going to say his name, yeah. Did you ever get your Did you ever get your 10,000 back? Yep. Yeah, don't be fooled by what you see on TV. And not everything that's on TV that claims to be a Christian is Christian. Okay? There's a lot of uh, thievery. There's a lot of um, greed and marketing. Intimidation. Yeah. Right. And if you don't do this, God will you know, not be too, ang too happy with you. I remember Oral Roberts years ago, and I'll give you an example. I, that God told him, this is what he said, God told me to raise two and a half million dollars, and if, he do, if we don't raise that two and a half million dollars, he's going to kill me. But you know how many people gave? Really? You have to be careful. You have to interpret scripture properly. Okay, let's go to qualification. I think we might be able to squeeze that in the next 10 minutes. This principle should be used whenever there is more than one verse or passage in scripture which deals with the same subject. In other words, when studying a subject in the Bible and all that the Bible has to say on that subject must be taken into consideration. So when you're if you're talking about, if you see something in scripture that talks about one single word, or you read something in the Bible, um, 
uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head right, right quick, uh, where it may be, okay, like conversation, the word conversation. Now, um, if I say the word conversation to you, what, is, what, do you, what do you, what would you say the meaning of that is? Talking, dialogue, right? Okay, but remember now, you're dealing with King James English, okay? And King James English, over the years, words have lost their meaning, okay? If you go back into the early, uh, I think, 1900s, the dictionaries, and uh, someone called me this one time, and I said, please don't call me that. They said, oh, you little bugger, you. You ever, you ever hear that terminology? Oh, you little bugger. You know what that means? The original meaning in that meant homosexual. They removed it from dictionaries, but if you go back far enough in the dictionaries and you look up the word bugger, it means a homosexual. Okay? See, this is what happens when you study a lot. You study things, you see things. Okay? But see, words have changed over time. Okay? I remember a time when gay meant happy. Today it has a whole a different whole meaning. If you were to walk around saying, "Oh, I'm gay today," <laughs> yeah, you might have a whole flock of different people coming over and getting your telephone number. Okay, words change over time. Like if you look in the Bible, I think it's First Peter chapter three. I'm doing this from my head, so I might be off a chapter or so. I don't know, but I think it's First Peter chapter three. It says, "Likewise, uh, wives, be subject to your own husbands, right, in everything." Well, that's everything within reason. That's not everything. If he wants you to do all, all kinds of weird, stupid stuff and un, ungodly stuff, no, you don't have to do that stuff. Okay? But then it goes on to say, and if your husband doesn't know Christ or is not a Christian, that he will be won by your chaste conversation. Now, I know many women have taken that verse and, and talked their husbands to death. Okay? But that's not, <laughs> that's not what it means. Okay? If you look it up... The, the, uh, the actual um, Greek to that word, conversation, means lifestyle. That how you live and how you respect and how you serve and how you love, all of those, that's, that's what conversation meant back then. But see, some, some women will read that and say, oh, I've got to talk to my husband more about Jesus. And they just say, oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. You know, it drives the husband crazy, you know. That's not what it means. It means by your lifestyle. So th those are some of the principles. But how are you going to know those words unless you look them up? And I told you about a story about a five-year-old, uh, I think it was five or seven. I don't remember. Maybe seven. Uh, his name was Steve Aruda. And, and my friend was going to buy him his first Bible. And he asked me, he said, okay, son, what, what Bible do you want? What version do you want? He said, Dad, I want a, I want a Bible like yours. And he said, well, he said, my Bible is the King James Version. It's going to be a little harder do you understand some of the words? And he said, that's okay, Dad, I'll look up. I'll look them up. And, you know, I, I know people always say, oh, the King James is so hard to read, the these, the thous. The means you. Thou means you. What's so hard? It's not hard. But again, you have to look it up. You have to study. You have to know God's word for yourself. You're only here Wednesdays and Sundays and Mondays if you come to prayer, which you should come, but if you don't come, don't worry. But you should be here, okay? And, but this is good, but you need to look up these words yourself. Find out what they mean and make sure that you're, before you share them with people, and I tell this all the time with people, even people that are going out evangelizing, don't go talking about Antichrist and dragons and Satan and the second coming and, and talking about the rapture and talking about tribulation period. Don't be talking about that stuff. They ain't going to have a clue to what you're, talk, what you're talking about. All that does is just puff you up to make, them, to make them look at you saying, boy, you're really knowledgeable. That's not why you want to do that stuff. You want to tell them very simply about Christ and what he's done for you, how he's forgiven you, how he's justified you, how he sanctified you, how he filled you with the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. You want to tell them about the experience of Jesus and the forgiveness of sin and how you feel cleansed and you feel right with God and you have the peace of God. That's what you want to share with people. I mean, if you have the good news, share the good news. 
Amen. You, you buy a new car. You, sh you show everybody, yeah, everybody wants to come over and see a new car. You show them a new car. Hey, this is what, it's got this, it's got that, it's got that, it's got this, it's got this, it's got that, it's got this, it's got that. You show me a new car. What about Jesus? Okay, enough with me rambling. Oh. Okay. The principle should be used whenever studying more than one verse in Scripture, qualifications. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. This verse has been used as the basis for the doctrine of baptism for the dead. However, there is nowhere else commanded in Scripture, and a cultural understanding of this passage shows that it was a non-Christian ceremony. Else what? Let's read the Scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are, not, why, why are they then baptized for the dead? Okay. Now, that's not, that's not affirming that we need to have a baptism for the dead. He's explaining something of what some people believed. He says, else what shall they do? Not us. They. So it's a different, different matter. What they do, which are baptized for the dead. See, some people read that. Say, oh, see, we've got we to gotta baptize the dead. So that's why you have, you know, the sprinkling of the... Baptism when they're dead, because you can't take a dead person in the water. I mean, I don't think I want to be dragging a dead person in the water. Okay. That's kind of weird. <laughs> okay. And that's not going around sprinkling them water on them either. <clears throat> but that was some of the, some of the uh, rituals that were on during this time in history. They would do these. They would have a baptism of the dead. And he's going on to explain that. So it doesn't promote baptism of the dead. Let's look at Mark 16, 16. Okay. If you read this scripture, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Oh, if I'm baptized, I'm saved. All I can do is be baptized and I'm saved. No. The key word here is believeth. Remember what I said when you were tearing apart a scripture, what you do? Who, what, when, where, why? Those are the five questions you ask. He that believeth. Believeth in who? Huh? Come on, speak it out. Who do you believe in? Jesus. Why do you believe in him? Huh? No, why do you believe in Jesus? Because he died for us. What did he die for? Our sins. And so we receive what? Forgiveness. See, you, you have to play that out and get that out. Because if not, then you think you, your baptism in water is what saves you. Baptism in water does not save you. If that was the case, you wouldn't, Jesus wouldn't have to go to the cross and shed his blood. You could just be baptized in water and you'd be, you'd be saved. No. See, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Believeth what? That Jesus Christ has come in the flesh to justify me, to sanctify me, and to make me righteous before God. You put the whole package together. Okay. Now, another scripture, it's not in my notes or anything, but it's in Acts uh, I think it's in Acts, if I can remember, 1038, is it? 1028? Let's see. Where is that scripture? That he was baptized, uh, you must be, he, they were baptized in Jesus, Jesus only. In the name of Jesus only. In the name, uh, was that, let's see, Acts 19.5, hold on a minute.
That doesn't sound. That's close, but that's not the one. It, has, it says Jesus only. They were baptized in the name of Jesus only. Acts 2.38. Let's see if that's the one. Where is it? Come on. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. No, that's not the one. Come on, somebody find it. You gotta find it. You got Google. Come on. Yep. I believe there is. Let me see if I can find it. They were baptized in the name of Jesus only. Eight sixteen, I think. Let's look at that one. Maybe that's the one. But I, I thought that there was another one. I think this is the one. I just had it backwards. Uh, what did I say it was? Verse 8 what? For as it yet was fallen none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Yeah, that's the one. So if you look at that, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They say that's the baptismal formula that you have to be baptized with. Is that right? So when you get baptized, you have, they put you under the water, I baptize you in the name of Jesus. Is that how it goes? Was this, was this, was this a baptismal formula? No. This is not a baptismal formula. What did Jesus tell us? In Matthew 28, what did Jesus tell us? Go ye into all the world and make disciples, right? Baptizing them in what? In the name of the Father, and the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. So Jesus gave us the formula. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Paul can't contradict what Jesus said. So it's not a contradiction. But so how do you come to a conclusion of what the scripture means? Remember there was there was different baptisms that would be taking place in that time of history. If you go back you study some of that you'll see there was the baptism of John, John the Baptist. There was different disciples that were being baptized in different So when they were saying that they were baptized in the name of the Lord it wasn't a formula. It was, it, was, it, was, it was an identity. They were identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ and what the Lord Jesus Christ taught the disciples and taught, taught them what to do. So in no way is it a formula where you just baptize in the name of Jesus. But some people take it that way. But that's not what it means. Okay? Some people say, well, it doesn't make any difference. Yes, it does. It does make a big difference. Because now you're, you're importing a doctrine in fact, there is a denomination, and I'm going to close with this. 
There is a denomination out there that's Pentecostal that says if you are not born again and you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ only and you speak in tongues, you are not saved. And there's a whole Pentecostal denomination, which the Assemblies of God, they kicked them out of fellowship. They excommunicated them out of fellowship because of that heresy. They were teaching that. Unless you were born again, speaking in tongues, and baptized in the name of Jesus only, you are not saved. So my first question is, what about the thief on the cross? He wasn't either speaking in tongues nor water baptized. What about when, they, when Peter said, uh, when Peter asked him, have you received the Holy Ghost yet? It's in Acts. He says, since you've been saved, we don't know if there even be a Holy Ghost. We haven't heard nothing. So apparently they were saved. Since you've been saved, have you heard about the Holy Ghost? No. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you've been saved? No, we don't even know if there is a Holy Ghost. So guess what? People that equate the baptism of the Holy Spirit with being saved, they're, they're not right. That's not correct interpretation. Receiving the Holy Spirit after you're saved. They, these people were saved and they received the Holy Spirit after. Proves the text that you are to be baptized with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Come on, somebody. That's an, that it's another gift that God has for the church. Okay. Any questions? We good? All right, God bless you on Facebook. God bless you here tonight. If you have any questions, write them down and look them up on the Internet for yourself. Now, let me just give you one thing. There's a thing called Blue Letter Bible, blueletterbible.org. If you go there and it opens up to the main page, up in the left-hand corner it says Classic. Click on that. And you will find Vine's Dictionary. You'll find Strong's coded to every single word in the, in, in the scriptures. You put a scripture in the, in the a search box. It'll bring that scripture up. And then you'll see there's a little box at the top. It says Strong's. You click on that, and it gives you all the numbers for Strong's. Click on the numbers. It opens up another box. gives you all the directions. Really simple to use. Great, great in, uh, study tool. Amen? All right, God bless.